Hello, I'm Jessica Donnington, presenting an 8 in 8 series on behalf of the Society for Thoracic Surgery. Today I'm going to provide an update of immunotherapy for resectable non-small cell lung cancer. So the perioperative landscape for immunotherapy and lung cancer has gotten very complex. We have many trials which have reported out in the last three years and several trials which we still anticipate reporting out in the next couple of years. In the adjuvant space, we have the Empower 010 and Keynote 091. In the neoadjuvant space, we have the Checkmate 816 trial and the periadjuvant space all within this last year where we heard from the Aegean trial, Neotorch trial, Keynote 0671, and the Checkmate 77T trial. We will briefly go through these, the populations they were used in, and their early results. So I'll start in the adjuvant space, and that's because these were the trials that reported out first. And one of the very first trials we heard about was the Empower 010 trial. This was reported by Heather Wakeley back at the World Lung in 2021. It was for completely resected stage 1B through 3A uh, patients, regardless of PDL1 status. The curve we see here is the disease free survival curve for those patients with stage 2 to 3A disease who are PDL1 positive. That represents about two thirds of the population. And this is the population that this drug received FDA approval for. Here we see the hazard ratio for disease free survival at 0.66, with a pretty significant increase in the survival. A lot of this was driven by those with high expression of PDL1, 50% or greater, but the approval was for any patients who are PDL1 positive, stage 2 to 3A. The next adjuvant trial was a Keynote 091 trial, or the PEARLS trial. This is a little less known by us in the United States. It was conducted primarily in Europe, and the design was very similar to the EMPOWER trial. It was for completely resected 1B to 3A patients, and they were randomized to receive a year of pembrolizumab or not. There were several important differences. So we didn't talk about it, but in the EMPOWER trial, everyone had to receive force, uh, had to receive at least one cycle of adjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy, where in the pembrolizumab trial, chemotherapy was only encouraged and was not required. Also, all of the endpoints in the pembrolizumab trial included the 1B population, a little bit different than the EMPOWER trial. This is the survival curve for all comers. Again, we're looking at disease-free survival uh, in all patients 1B through 3A, regardless of PDL1 status. And I put this curve here because this is what this FDA approval was for also. This trial had one complicating factor. And that is because in the high PDL1 expressors, we did not see the survival advantage we had expected. It's been a pretty consistent finding through all of our trials that the greatest benefit is in patients with high PDL1 expression, all trials except this one. And so we've all questioned why that is, and we don't have a great reason. But that's where we are with our near with our adjuvant space right now. Next comes the neoadjuvant space. There is a single trial here. It is Checkmate 816, and we don't have any other trials really on the horizon at this moment. Uh, the first thing we saw was from Patrick Ford uh, it, in AACR, and that was the pathologic complete response. The pathologic response is one of the key and exciting aspects of neoadjuvant trials because we get this marker of response, which is so good, and we get it so early, we do not have to wait for recurrences. And in this trial, we saw this 12-fold improvement in PATH-CR with the addition of nivolumab to three cycles of chemotherapy prior to resection in patients with 1B to 3A lung cancer. We then saw event-free survival, which again has looked very nice with a hazard ratio of 0.68. And then these wonderful curves that show the correlation between PATH-CR and event-free survival. So it really feels that if we can get a PATH-CR, we have really picked out a population where we know our patients have a wonderful chance of real cure and survival. And I think this has been one of the most important aspects of these trial, of this trial particularly, and of all of our periadjuvant trials, is actually finding a population where we provide 
cure and getting that answer early. And then again, this year we see many, many trials. The first one we saw was a GN, so a perioperative trial. Patients with resectable stage 2 to 3A receive four cycles of Dervalumab plus chemotherapy, go on to resection, and then receive a year of Dervalumab. All of the trials in this column have that design. They are incredibly similar, both in their design and in a lot of their results. So here we see event-free survival with Dervalumab with a hazard ratio of 0.68, kind of similar to what we saw maybe with the Checkmate trial, but that is not unexpected because most of what we're seeing in early results is really reflects the neoadjuvant treatment and not really the adjuvant treatment. Next here we see the keynote trial. This was presented at ASCO, and not only have we seen event-free survival and pathologic response on this trial, this is the very first trial to provide us an overall survival advantage. And it did receive FDA approval based upon this uh, hazard ratio of 0.72. We also saw something called the NeoTorch trial. This trial is primarily out of China. Again, a similar protocol with pre-op and post-op uh, chemoimmunotherapy. This trial is a little different in that these were only 3A patients, which were reported at ASCO, hence that big survival curve difference we see there. And then finally, the last trial we saw, which was reported at ESMO this fall, was the Checkmate 77T with four cycles of NEVO plus chemo followed by the year of NEVO. And again, we're seeing curves for event-free survival, which are all quite similar. So now I'm going to break all the rules and do cross-trial comparisons. This is against every statistical rule and everything we've ever been taught about clinical trials. But I will say again, the populations of patients studied in these trials are incredibly similar, as are the treatments. So the agents are different, but I think that this is only maybe breaking 90 out of 100 rules. But you can see if you look at the PATH CR that the results are quite similar with all of these trials. With PATH CR, with the addition of immunotherapy to chemotherapy ranging between 17 and 25 percent, and with a dramatic increase from their control arms. Similarly, major pathologic response, which represents 10% viable tumor, we see similar upticks and very consistent across all trials. And I think that is really important. We also get to see this subtle comparison of three versus four cycles and asking, is there a benefit to that four cycle? It is hard to know. It is also important to remember that even though the protocols called for four cycles of chemo, not every patient received that. Next, again, cross-trial comparing all of the event-free or disease-free survival. Here, I am cheating more. When we look at that adjuvant trials compared to the neoadjuvant, periadjuvant, that is a slightly different population. Those trials were dominated by 1B instead of uh, stage 2 or 3A patients. The neoadjuvant and periadjuvant trials were dominated by stage uh, 3A patients, representing in most of them somewhere between you know, 70 and 75 percent of their patients. But again, we see consistent improvements in disease-free survival or event-free survival with the addition of uh, immunotherapy to chemotherapy. Overall survival, we only have three trials that have reported that to date, and the most significant being the periadjuvant regime with Keynote 061. It is a very large trial, uh, and I do feel that we will probably get to this point with our other neoadjuvant and periadjuvant regimes. So in conclusion, we do have growing evidence for the benefit of peri in the perioperative setting for the addition of immunotherapy, be that adjuvant, neoadjuvant, and periadjuvant. Checkmate 816 remains the only pure neoadjuvant trial, and it was truly, truly practice changing for us in surgery. Uh, we definitely see improvements in event-free survival and pathologic response. 
I think we see really encouraging early uh, overall survival improvements, but we are left with questions. And one of the major questions has to do with the value of added adjuvant therapy to neoadjuvant therapy, and do we need that in every patient? I would say the reg these regimes are safe, but we also have to keep in mind that we have seen significant attrition, not only attrition before surgery, but between surgery and adjuvant phases. And I think as surgeons, we need to be very cognizant of that and careful in our patient selections. What does this mean for us as lung cancer, pro cancer providers? Well, it definitely requires a little bit more work. We do have to understand these agents and their indications so that we can explain them to our patients. These all require biomarker testing. This is very new for surgeons, and we need to find ways to in, uh, integrate that into our workflows. We have to anticipate delays. I can no longer see a stage two patient on a Tuesday, operate on a Friday, and have them home on Monday. I have many more steps that they need to go through in order to give them the best chance for survival, and I have to accept some technical challenge. A couple more hours might be worth it in the operating room to improve someone's chance for an overall survival. Thank you.